Okay, sound like I'm on. Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I got to tell you, I was uh, really happy when I woke up this morning and I saw the sun. It's been a crazy week with the water and the weather, but <clears throat> uh, before I get into that, I, uh, I'm really blessed to be up here today because I was absolutely tortured this week. I had to go to a Bitcoin investigation school. So uh, I was locked down in a room with a bunch of Secret Service agents who had PhDs in math and all that good stuff. So I thought, why did I sign up for this class? So uh, it actually turned out to be really, really good. I really uh, found it interesting. And uh, so if anybody ever gets into the Bitcoin thing and you become victimized in the Bitcoin area, I'm your guy. Come see me. I'll, I'll get you out of that. Um, no, but it was a good class, but uh, I must have, I wear my feelings on my face a lot. Is that the way I want to say that? I cannot hide my feelings. I'd be terrible at poker. And the instructor who was given the class from uh, Los Angeles looked at me and said, listen, stop trying to understand it and just accept it, that it is what it is and you just have to get through it. So, and that helped. So I, I survived the class and I'm here. So when I say I'm blessed to be here, I'm blessed that I'm here and not back at that school. And then at the end, I love it when they say, oh, this was a four-day school, but we're, we crammed it into one day for you. And I'm like, okay, well, thank you, because my brain didn't work for a couple days after that. But um, did anybody get affected by the rain? Was anybody affected by that? Boy, everybody saw the pictures of what was going on around on social media. Did you see all the damage? That was insane, wasn't it? I've been here 20, 28, 29 years, and I don't think I remember ever really seeing it as bad as it was. One time in like 92, 93-ish, somewhere around there, it was pretty bad. And I usually gauge it from my house. I can see where the weather goes across, and it usually is going across to Bill and Donna's house. So I look at the rain coming down, and I always think, okay, I better call those guys because it's headed for them. Uh, and I gauge it a lot through talking to Bill. And if Bill says, yeah, I came up to the third step, they have stairs that go down to Oak Creek. They have stairs that go down to Oak Creek in their backyard, and it's actually really beautiful. Um, not, now. not now, yeah, not now. And, and Bill will say, yeah, it only came up to the second step or it came up to the third step, and I know I gauge it by how many steps it got up and how many, how many stairs it took out during the flood. So I'm glad he's okay, and I'm glad you guys are all okay too. But uh, I think my cell phone weather lies to me all the time, but I think we're supposed to get rain again this week, so uh, just for one day, maybe Thursday. Um, I did this, uh, I found out I was gonna be here. I like to share this with you and I do this a lot when I come up here and I tell you how I came to where I am today with what I'm talking about. And I think I was, I was informed that I'm gonna be up here three months ago, roughly. We, we do it in three month increments, just about. And uh, so I used to procrastinate. If you looked up procrastination in the dictionary, dictionary like, you, like you've heard before, you would see my picture there. I love putting stuff off. So I didn't this time, I, I started right away, like uh, our meetings are on Fridays and I started right away getting ready and I got a word and I, I just got on fire for it and I, I got it knocked out. And I think I was done with my entire deal, my entire sermon or teaching, whatever you wanna call it, within a week. And I'm busy during the week. So um, I think it was Sunday, Ty was talking and I'm sitting back there and Ty said something and wham got a new word, and that doesn't come from me. So I had to scrap four notes, and I had it, uh, I usually write my notes, but I even did them on a computer, and I made them look all nice, and that, I just had to get rid of them because it wasn't what I was supposed to talk about. So, and I like to be obedient to that, and it was really exciting, and every time that happens, some of you might think, wow, well, I gotta come up here and speak, you know, put yourself in those shoes, and I gotta prepare something for so long, and, not sound like a blubbering idiot up here, and then all of a sudden it changes, and, and you just have to roll with it. But every time I've done that, I, I, I'm just writing the notes. I just listen to what's coming into me, just kind of like what Steve Moffat does. So it's always exciting. Um, I went to make bulletins last night at work. I use, yes, I use work-related equipment to get my personal job done sometimes. And I went in there last night, and we have this computer system, and you gotta have, I have two cell phones that I use, and I forgot to bring my work cell phone, so I literally can't get on my work computer without my work cell phone. So I thought, okay, I'm not doing bulletins. So I just left it. And Steve, uh, Steve told me this morning, somebody said it, Murphy's Law kicked in, and Murphy is a constant passenger with me. 
And uh, I got up early this morning and I went in there and I knocked it out like it was nothing and nobody bothered me and there was a group of people working there today and I, I just got it knocked out, so it worked out good. So um, I'm not, in certain things, I'm not the most computer savvy, but in other things I, I excel in, so I can't figure that out. I wanna just touch base real quick on a couple of things. Ty's gonna put a couple pictures up there on psychological warfare. This is not what I'm talking about today, but I wanted to include it. Um, and Ty's, a, I, I got a shout out to him because he saves me all the time with photographs and putting stuff up. So he's got a couple of pictures here. Has anybody ever seen this stuff before? Has everybody ever seen these, this type of uniform? So what this is is, and I took these pictures, so bear with me, and I did that with a cell phone, and they're pretty horrible, but at least you can get the idea. So back in the, I don't know, somewhere between 1400 and 1600, uh, a group of these gentlemen would wear this apparatus into battle. And I actually got to see an original set when I was in Europe, and it was pretty remarkable. So what that is, the wings on the back are actually wood wings and they take um, clay or a lot of it was made with honey and they would let the honey harden on the wood wings and they'd stick one of those feathers in there. So it, it's very time consuming to make. What that is for is when they would ride on horseback into battle, the wind would rush through those wings or those feathers, sorry. And if you put 30, 50, 100 guys on the back of a horse with that sound, it would make an immense loud noise, just the wind running through those or blowing through those feathers. If you've ever been outside and you've, a raven or a crow flies over you, listen to it, you can hear the wind, so imagine that uh, with 100 guys. And what that was designed for was to upset the enemy's horses, and they would be discouraged or scared, and as well as the riders, imagine that coming into your yard 50 or 100 of those guys, it would be pretty, pretty amazing. But the reason I bring that up is because the shofar is a similar tool. It's a similar tool that we use, and we use one here almost every Sunday. Um, a couple, three weeks ago when Pastor Juan and Devin were up here, Devin actually did the shofar over an electric guitar, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I, I just thought that was amazing. So uh, the shofar, I'm going to read you something out of that out of the Bible in Joshua, and it's not in your notes. You gotta, so just so you know, if you have a bulletin, you are not gonna see written scripture in there. I don't print it out because I, I did this this morning and I had to hurry and I was fast, so I didn't write them all out. But Ty does not have this one, but in Joshua chapter six, verse four, I'm gonna read it. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. I don't know about you guys, but I, I have a study Bible here, and that's what this is for. So if I don't understand a scripture, I get to go to the notes, and it's really interesting. So the walls of this fortified city, I believe it was Jericho, were knocked down by the blowing of those trumpets, by the blowing of the shofar. Does anybody know how thick the walls were? The outer walls were six feet, but it had an inner wall as well that was 12 feet thick. So that's a lot of, lot of stone. I have a wall around my backyard, a garden wall they call it, a garden block they call it. It's like a cinder block, but it's thinner, and there's 260 feet of that, and in some places it's, it's regulation, it's six feet high, but in some places I wanted it seven and they made it seven and I'm out of regulation, but I think of that wall and then I think about the wall to the city where people use shofars to knock the walls down. How powerful is that? So when, we, when you hear those, it's great. I love when, when the ladies bring their shofars and they start out that way, it's awesome. And a lot of people aren't used to that, but it's such a cool tool. And I told them, I'm gonna get one someday and I'm gonna do it. And of course, I still haven't done that, but I will, I'm gonna surprise you someday. And I saw a, uh, does anybody know who Isaiah Saldivar is? He's a preacher, pastor, whatever. He's a pastor in Southern California, young guy. He's about 30. He gets into his messages pretty hardcore. And he's outside on this one. He's speaking outside, and there's this line of guys, and they're all young. They're probably in their late, mid-20s. I say they're, they're young to me. They're late 20s, early 30s. And there's a five or six of them, and they're in, while he's preaching, they are blowing on the shofar. And they are not just blowing on the shofar, they're getting their whole body into it. 
And it is such an amazing thing to see. So very cool stuff. And I'm glad we do it here. Just imagine with that, I want to touch on one more thing with that before I get started. Imagine what it's going to be like when hundreds or thousands of angels that we're going to be with when they come back to the earth with Jesus on the second coming. Imagine what that's going to sound like. I'm getting spiritual goosebumps talking about it, but just the blowing of the shofars and the wind running through wings, and it's just going to be an amazing time. I can't wait. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. I have three, three or four separate topics to talk about here, so bear with me. I don't have anything that's in any specific order, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to start. And uh, the first topic I'm going to hit is sin's dominion is broken in us. And Ty's been talking about this over the past few Sundays, which I love. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a fan of all the Bible, but I really like the book of Romans. Um, it's one of my favorite books. And I've got a few verses out of Romans that I'm going to share with this. Uh, while I'm talking. So the first verse is going to be Hebrews 12, 28. And I may, be, I may be reading from a different version of the Bible than what's up here, so just uh, bear with me there. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. When you're focused on him, nothing can shake or move you. Trust me, what I see sometimes when I go to work uh, I'm, I love this verse, and I have verses in my office, and I'm really fortunate because I work with four other Christians in that office, in that little area. So believe it or not, when we're, we're extremely busy, but somebody will just shout a question out from their office, and, it, and we'll get into our, I have a Bible version at work that I carry there, and so do the other guys. And even, though, even if one of them doesn't, we can get on the computer and get on a Bible app, and we'll start talking about it. And it's amazing, and I'm blessed to have that. But that's very powerful. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many. Brethren, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. There are three main words in this verse, in these verses, predestined, justified, and glorified. And everyone here has filled that. You're, you're, you're part of all three. Your walk with the Father was predestined. You being here this morning is predestined, believe it or not. No matter what you've done in the past, you're justified and glorified in Him. And I run into people all the time that think they have done something so bad in their life that they are not going to be accepted into heaven, which is really sad to me. And I'm glad I'm the one they come to. Uh, I'm just the specific tool in the shed that gets to get used that day, and I tell them there is nothing, absolutely nothing in your past that is going to forfeit your salvation that you've walked away from. It's huge. It's hugely important. And I talk to other younger police officers that may have been involved in a, a traumatic situation where they get into a shooting, which is extremely traumatic, um, and they don't think that they rate to go because they've been in that shooting, and it's not true. You're, you're an implement of God, and unfortunately, those things happen, and you, that doesn't negate you walking through the gates of heaven, ever. But I seem to have this, I, I seem to have this happen quite a bit, not only with, with those folks, but with everyday people as well. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I love it. Micah 7, chapter 7, verse 19. He will again have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of your sins into the depths of the sea. You are free from your past sins, and your sins are cast into the sea of forgetfulness. I read that once a long time ago, that our sins are cast into the sea of forgetfulness, and I love that. Um, it's just an amazing verse. I was going to say something, but I'm going to hold back on that. I'm learning to bridle my tongue, so I'm good there. If you're wondering what I'm saying, I'll get with, come get me afterwards, and I'll, I'll tell you, but... Um, definition of glorified. Can anybody give me a definition of what glorified means? No takers? Okay, I want you to listen to this. Because you're glorified. Everyone here is glorified. To praise or honor something or someone to an extreme degree. Not to a little degree. Not to a partial degree. To an extreme degree. Jesus and the Father have glorified all of us. That's crazy important. And you may look at that and go, what, what have I done to deserve that? You know, don't, 
not take that serious. That is huge. Romans 6.14. I'll let these guys catch up. They're probably like, hey, man, slow down. I'll read it straight from the screen. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. This is a touchy one. It's good news, but this can be a touchy one for some people. The first thing I want to say is don't let sin be successful in you. Don't let it continue in you. Don't let it tempt you. Let go of that. You've been... You've been covered in grace, but we can't take grace for granted, right? And I hear this, and I, I've got to tell you, I hear this from my other Christian friends, nobody that goes here, but, and they say, or they'll be, in, they'll be doing something that's obviously sin, and I get that word. Hey, I'm covered in grace. That gives me a green light to do this. Well, actually, no, it doesn't. That's the, the total opposite of what this is, and that does not give you a green light to go out and do whatever you want, okay? You can't go in a Circle K and take whatever you want without paying for it. That's a problem. Uh, you aren't covered for that. Don't take it for granted. Paul is, did I do six, one through three already? Okay, next one, Ty. I think I'm ready for that one. Romans six, verses one through three. Well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace, which is what I just talked about? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? That's huge. That's a reminder that we can't just go out and continue on sinning and doing whatever we please and whatever we want to do. Paul is using the word baptized kind of in a metaphorical sense here, as we might say someone was immersed in their work or underwent a baptism of fire. We've all heard that before or experiencing some kind of trouble. So that's basically what that means. Do you guys have any questions so far? Are you still with me? Good. All right. I'm rolling through here pretty quick. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'm happy to answer it. Sure. The definition of glorify. Mm-hmm. You want me to give that to you again? To praise or honor something or someone to an extreme degree. Key word there being extreme. All right, here's a tough one. This is a tough one I've battled with for a long time. I get it now. And now that I'm older, I'm good at it. I like to say I won't say I'm good at a lot, but I'm good at this now. But when I was younger, I was not. And this is uh, knowing when to turn the other cheek. Is that easy for anybody out here? That's a tough one, right? Especially me. I'll tell you, I've got a little story to back this up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Man, that's tough for me. Okay, now what does this mean? I kind of dove into this a little bit. This only deals with matter of personal retaliation, not criminal offenses, okay? They're after a person, they're after your dignity. They're trying to make you feel whatever they're trying to make you feel. You don't measure up or, or they're using your past against you. A criminal matter, you go to the police over and then I get to deal with that for you. What it definitely, what it definitely means is, is that Jesus applied this principle of, a non of non-retaliation to all affronts against one's dignity. So here's a little bit of what I go through when I get to go to a trial. I like trial to a degree. It depends on the trial, and there's a lot that goes into a trial. How many people here have been on a jury? Quite a few, right? Um, just so you know, if you don't want to do jury duty anymore, you can get out of jury duty. Did you guys know that? Yeah. Bill does. I've gotten Bill and Donna out of it before. No. No, you just say that you know me. Seriously, if you know a police officer, you don't have to do jury duty anymore. If you say something to the effect, I'll bill you all you later on this, but I'm just kidding. You could say you know a police officer, and my, my take on this is, is now tainted because I know and I talk to him. So you don't have to do jury duty anymore. All right, so, yes, sir.
So yes, we know what's going on in the plot, and so we immediately dismiss the question. Yeah, but and if you want to stay, just yeah. don't say that. You can still stay. Um, <laughs> there you. Oh, you you'll get called then if you want to, because I still get them, and they they just they just mass mail them out, and then I get them. So I'll send mine to you. <laughs> Um, so anyway, when I, go, when I go to a trial, and I've been in a few over the last 28 years, some big trials, uh, one of the things that happens is, is I think I do a really good job on my cases, and I write a really long, detailed report on whatever crime it is or why, whatever it is. Most of my cases were drug cases. So I've gone up against some really big wig attorneys uh, from drug cartels out of Phoenix and they're paid a lot of money and they're paid money not to lose. And what happens if you get connected with a drug cartel and you don't succeed at your job? That could be interesting for them. Um, so their only attack for the defense attorney is to attack me. And they'll attack, and it starts early. It starts in what we call a defense interview. So that means I sit in an office with a defense attorney and the county attorney and then they ask questions, and they do all kinds of stuff. Now, one of the tactics that they use is they'll get, my, they'll get my work history. I have a file of everything I've ever done, and they get that file, and that has everything in it. It's, and I'm an open book anyway. I, I really don't care. Have at it. If that's all you have, and I know you're going to come after me, and that's your big defense, I already won, because I know this isn't going to fly in court. So, but they'll take, they'll take me apart. And it starts in a defense interview. And then when I go to trial, I don't really know what they're going to say once I get on the stand. But I'm on the stand in a full courtroom during a pretty high-profile trial. And I'm up there. And there's a jury. And then there's family and friends of the bad guy, family and friends of the victim. It's a full room. There could be upwards of 100 and some odd people in there, depending on where I'm going to trial. So the defense attorney immediately will ask me some questions. And then they'll start to attack. So they will discredit me. They will make me look like I'm completely stupid. They will call me a liar. I've had them do it completely on the stand in front of a lot of people. They will make you feel like you have no business being up there. And that's just a, a design to make you falter while you're, while you're giving your side of the story. A good county attorney will rebut all that and fix it as they go along. But every time I've gone, it's been the same thing, and you get used to it. So is that, am I supposed to turn the other cheek on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm supposed to turn the other cheek. So what's happened after a trial, I can't tell you how many I've been in. I've been in quite a few. I'll be walking down the hallway and I'm leaving. I'm done. It's been a three-day trial. And imagine being up there in front of all these people for three days and you're just getting cut in half. It gets interesting. I'm used to it now and now I, I, I like it. So. Uh, I have an, an attorney in the family, so I can say some things about attorneys. Is there any attorneys here? <laughs> I have an attorney in my family, and, and he's a great guy. And, and I just spent some vacation days with him, and it's, it's different. And, and I'm, I'm a cop, so there's cop humor, and I will not barf that out on you because you'll think I need to be in a straitjacket. But I will go after my brother-in-law, and then he goes after me. And it gets, you know, we, we've got to be careful because I'll – I got to be careful to not, I got to turn the other cheek. As a matter of fact, this past couple weeks ago, he said, so you, uh, you violate people's constitutional rights. I was telling him about this drug case I had, and I couldn't get into the bad guy. So, um, man, I'm on camera, so I got to be really careful. This could come back to get me. <laughs> so I did something to, to, to help a traffic stop happen. I'll just leave it at that. So um, our canine guy got onto the bad guy, and it worked. So... But he said, hey, so you violate people's rights, and he's going down this road. And I'm like, I do it every day. So it just <laughs> irritates him. I don't do that every day, but it irritates him. So, so anyway, I, after the trial, I'm walking down the hallway, and I'm, I'm, go, I'm walking away from the county attorney. Whether I win or whether I lose, I still get that ridicule from the defense attorney. And I've had a couple of defense attorneys call me as I'm walking down the hallway. Hey, Jeff, hold up. And I'm like, hmm, now what can I do here? I can be... I can be in my flesh, and I can keep walking. I can turn around and say, if you want to say anything else to me, go get a subpoena, and then I'll talk to you, or I can handle it like a Christian. And it's taken me a long time, and trust me, early on, I used to say, go get a subpoena if you want to talk to me, and I just keep walking. 
so they know where you stand. So anyway, on the last couple that have done this, which has been years ago, they've got me in the hallway and said, hey, listen, no hard feelings. And I'm like, oh, OK, you're talking to me out here in the hallway. Let's go back into the courtroom and get everybody back in there, and you do this. And I've said that. And they're like, ooh, I planted a seed, right? I wasn't trying to plant a seed. I was being sarcastic. But it's tough. It's tough to turn the other cheek sometimes because you just ridiculed me. And I've actually had a victim do it. She read a letter at the end ridiculing somebody else, but it looked like she was ridiculing me. And she never cleared it up. And I'm testifying on her behalf, trying to help her out. And she got with me afterwards and says, man, I probably shouldn't have read that letter. And I'm like, I knew what you meant. It's all good. Nobody else in the courtroom knew. They thought it was me, but it wasn't. So I have to be, if we're walking with the Lord, like I said earlier, we, we don't lean on our own understanding, right? We, we lean on that understanding. God will work out a trial. He doesn't care. He'll, he'll make his will happen. So turning the other cheek, that's, that's a tough one. Imagine Jesus. This has come to me every time that I go through this. Imagine Jesus' trial for us. Look what he went through. And now I don't compare to that at all. And I'm not comparing myself to that. That's a completely different ballgame. But imagine what he went through when he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Wow, that's powerful. I am nowhere near that. I cannot do that. I don't look at a defense attorney and go, Father, forgive him or her for he, he or she doesn't know what they're doing. I, I, I'm not there yet. Mark 11, verses 24 and 25. This is a tough one, and I just got into a really big, I'll call it an argument, but it's more of a debate with somebody over this, this past week. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins too. That's another tough one, and I'm bombarding you with two tough ones. At least they, they can be tough for me. Forgiveness. Okay, I want to just take this verse for a couple of seconds. I'm sorry i got to keep putting my glasses on. I'm at that age where I can't do anything without them. There are no limitations on a believer's prayers. So do we go pray for a winning lottery ticket? Yeah, you can pray for a winning lottery ticket. You can. It doesn't mean you're going to win. Why, does it, why is that? It's got to be God's will, right? I'll, I'll make a little bit of a confession. I might have said it up here a long time ago, but I got an elk tag back in 2007 in a really good unit, and I went to Donna. And this was back before we had the healing room where I would have came and saw you guys. <laughs> And I said, hey, will you pray for me? Because if you need something in prayer, now I've never asked anybody from the healing room for prayer yet, and I'm sure there are rock stars in that. But Donna Voss is really, she, she was the rock star at the time, and she probably still is. But So I, I asked her, and I didn't know what kind of response I was going to get. I said, hey, will you pray that I, I get an elk? And she didn't even hesitate. She said, yeah, absolutely. I'll pray that you get an elk. And she did. And I left. And day two, I was done. I was completely done with my hunt. It was great. So I, I got an elk. So you can ask for it, but it has to be God's will. We have to remember that. It's not our will, it's his will. We are to be faithful and obedient to the clear teaching on prayer that Jesus gives in this passage. Okay, don't forget that. Turn your prayers over to God and leave it alone. I can't tell you. There's people I've prayed for for 20-some years, and I'm going to continue to pray. That's not what this is talking about. Continue to pray. I'm not saying turn it over to God, pray one time, and leave it. You continue to keep those people in prayer. I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but how many people have seen the prayer board next door in the, in the uh, food ministry? That thing is powerful, isn't it? So I was here cleaning the church a couple weeks ago, and I don't know what happened, but I needed sugar. So I ran down there, and I knew. Sorry, Bill. I ran down there, and I knew. And I got the best probably week or two old chocolate eclair I've ever eaten in my life. And I, I walked out, and the prayer board hit me. And I'm looking at the prayer board, and I'm like, wow. So I, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. So I'm reading the prayer board, and there's a section of requested prayer, and then it's split in two with a piece of tape, I think. And the other half is answered prayer. And there are just as many, if not more, answered prayers than there are prayer requests. Well, I started to get, I got reading some of the requested prayers over there, and i got to tell you, I will get emotional talking about this. 
I started reading what people wanted and what they were praying for. And I mean, what, when I say wanted, I mean they're praying for family members, most of them, medical issues, family problems, things of that nature. And they're powerful. So I sat there and I prayed, and we used to have somebody that came to this church, and that was her job. Her job was to take a chair, go over there, and do nothing but pray all the prayers on that prayer board. And she'd be worn out by the end. It was, it was amazing. Um, if you haven't been there, go there and take a look at that. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. And if you don't want to go there during the food hour times, I'm sure get with one of the leadership team members here, and we'll be happy to, to show you that. It's pretty awesome. Successful prayer requires faith. Everybody here has faith? When you're praying for something, you've got to have the faith that it's going to go. I, and it's got to be God's will. Just remember that. I, my dad had Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, and I can't remember what else. He had three separate diseases all at the same time. He's passed away. But I went there to take care of him for a while so my mom could get a break, and I laid hands on him. And he was in and out. He, Alzheimer's patients, if, you're, if you don't know how that works, they really start to go downhill fast in the afternoons. He was great in the mornings. In the afternoons, he'd, it, it'd be, we'd be standing off with forks in the kitchen sometimes, you know, ready to fork fight. <laughs> but I laid hands on him, and I had all the faith in the world that I'm going to heal him right now. And I put my hands on his shoulder and my, my hand on his head, and I, he let me pray for him. He was in a good place that day. And I'm like, we're good. We're done immediately. You're going to be healed. And of course, he wasn't because that's not God's will. But I did get to teach, or not teach, but I did get to talk to him about the Lord, and he was very, very receptive of that. So I'm, I'm blessed beyond measure just to have the chance to do that. So I have a friend of mine talking about forgive someone. And I know what I go through and what you go through are two different things. I forgive people right away. And if somebody apologizes to me, and, and this is just a God thing, I, I forgive them immediately. I don't care what they've done to me. If they apologize, instantaneously you are forgiven. And why is that? Because if we ask for forgiveness, it's instant. You can't dwell on it. It's, it's that fast. It's, it's at the twinkling of an eye, as the Bible says it. It's quick. So I'm, I don't know why, and, I, and I'm going to sin right now. I'm sorry, but I am struggling with a friend of mine right now, and he is running me ragged. So... Uh, he's a supposed believer. Uh, he was invited here today, and he basically, in about a second and a half, said, absolutely not, no way am I coming. And I'm like, okay. Um, he has an offense against somebody else who is also a friend of mine. And, and it's a long story, but she offended him. She did something to him physically, um, joking around, and he took it serious. He took it way too serious. And he's a, a bit of a drama king. Um, and it went way too far on his end. So I talked with her about it because I work with her and she's completely open to rectifying the relationship. And this has been almost a year. So I'll, I'll bring it up. I have breakfast with him once a week and I'll bring it up to him and I'll say, hey man, you, what's going on with you and her? What are you doing? What are you doing to make the situation right? Um, and he's like, I'm never talking to her again. I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, you, and I read this verse to him. I said, you understand that if you don't forgive her, you're, you're not going to be forgiven by the Father. And that's a problem for you. And I can talk to him like this. I'm, I'm not, I, I gauge my conversations with specific people, and I know what I can, how I can talk to other, certain people. So um, the sad thing is, is he told me that he stopped, he ran into her. And she was sitting down at a table somewhere, I think it was at a local restaurant, and she actually stood up to embrace him and hug him. And he denied that. And he walked past her. And I'm like, that hurt me. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? What are you gaining from this behavior? You know, you're not gaining anything. Why don't you, and I tell people that all the time when I used to handle calls on the street, people would neighbor problems. Oh man, I could tell you stories all day, funny stuff. But They'd say, how, I'd always get one that, could, that I knew I could, that I could get to, that, meaning I could talk to. And they'd be like, hey, what, what would you do if you were me? Well, this is what I would do if I were you. I would go in and I would bake a plate of brownies and put a note on that plate and go to their front door and say, hey, this is it. This is peace. I don't want any more of this. Accept it or not. Tell me to leave if you want. And people actually did it. 
It was, actually, it was really awesome to see that. Not that I'm the answer to all neighbor problems. I'm not. There's some people, you, and we all know them, you're just not going to change them. But you can plant the seed. Luke 23, 34. This is a little bit about what I was talking about before. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And these soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Man, how strong is that? That's just crazy. Can we do that? Can we do this every day with people that we run into? Can, do, can, do we have it in us to say, Father, please forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm, I'm battling with a very hardcore criminal right now. Um, and we're going to go to trial. And he's on social media going to town on me. And I'm like, I love it. Go. Do your thing, dude. Um, but it's tough. And he just doesn't know. And I got him in an interview room, and he invoked, meaning he did not want to talk to me, which was fine. So I just talked to him about God, because I monitored his social media page, and I saw people trying to get him and lead him to the Lord, which was really cool. And that's how I started it off. But he's going through a little deception right now, so he, he didn't want to touch on that. But I'm just glad I got, to, I got to say that and bring that up to him. And I don't know, maybe a seed got planted. I don't know. But... That's not up for me. My job was to plant the seed, and I got it done. There's people out there, and this goes along with this, that are, and I have it right now, every day. And if you think you have it, come see me, because I have a lot of people that do this to me, and I'm good with it. They are drinking gallons of poison watching you and waiting for you to die all the time. Pray for those people, seriously. I have someone out there that I haven't spoken to in a decade, over 10 years. But we have a mutual friend that this person does not know is my mutual friend as well. And, this, and Pastor Juan talked about this some months ago. And that person will come over to my house or I'll see that person out in town and they'll say, man, so-and-so is ripping you apart over there. They're doing this, this, and this, and saying this. And I'm like, I'm old now. I really don't care. I, I'm, I'm at peace with myself. And if that's what that person needs to do, then they need to do that. that that's between them and God at the end of the day. You just have to let that go. I will not allow someone to live in my mind rent-free. You cannot do it. Don't do that. I have kept myself awake many a night wondering the same thing. Why am I doing that? Why am I allowing some toxic person to live in my mind rent-free? Not going to do it anymore. I'll tell you what, I wake up in the middle of the night very early in the morning, 2 o'clock, 2.30, whatever, and, man, i got to get back to sleep quick because if this little wheel starts turning in here, that hamster will get going, and I'm just up. I'm up for the rest of the night, and if you can remember to do this, this works. Trust me. 1 Peter 4.8. This, to me, this verse is a gift. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. If you have sins in your life, but you show love to someone, this is how I read this, your sins are covered because you love someone. Our, our, there's people out there we have a hard time loving, right? I have a friend that went through a very traumatic situation beginning at the age of 8 until they were 18, and they were physically attacked by someone for 10 years. And I would talk with this person occasionally, and I would say, how's it going with that? Now, I have no idea how that is. My little world and what I go through is completely different than this person's. It's very severe. And this person would tell me, not going to do it, can't get past it, don't want to hear from that person. I, they victimized me for that long. I'm not dealing with it. Until that other person, I'll just say the bad guy, wrote this person a letter who found Jesus and read these verses that I'm going over and was convicted and said, please forgive me. How powerful is that? So I didn't know this happened. And this other person, this other friend of mine came to me and said, hey, I got this letter. Look at this. And I lost it. I'm like, whoa, how powerful is that? So and since then, that person passed away, but they did the right thing. And they confessed their sin, they accepted Jesus, and they wrote a letter to, to this other person, and they said, hey, I messed up, and I messed up big, and I'm sorry I affected you this way. I didn't know it, and I just hope you forgive me. And my other friend did. 
And what they said was, I don't want to be the reason somebody doesn't get to go to heaven. And I don't want to be the reason that I stand before the Father and he says, I can't forgive you because you didn't forgive this person. That's just huge. It's very, very powerful. 1 Peter 4, 8, this means that a Christian should overlook sins against him or her if possible and always be ready to forgive insults and unkindness. It doesn't matter if you're having a bad day or you have to, what I do want you to do is pray about it and think about it. I have my days too, trust me. I have a little checklist I go through every single morning before I step out of my door. And if I'm back up here again, I'll, I'm going to add that checklist in and maybe it'll help you guys. It helps me. And, if, and I'm a pretty big knuckle dragger, so if it helps me, it could help you. Um, but I'll add that in next time. Relationship, the last topic I think I have, and then uh, I'm going to let you guys get on with your Sunday. God says he wants to know you. We go to church every Sunday, but do we know the Father? We wander in here on a Sunday, and I, you, all you... The, you people that know me well, you've heard me say this before, we wander in on a Sunday. What do we do starting Monday morning? Are we back in the world again? Um, here's my weakness. And those of you that know me know, I, I drive an unmarked car. So I see everything. But my car has lights and they're hidden. So it's fun for me. <laughs> so I have a, if, you, if Ty put a camera in my car, we could make millions of dollars just on my reaction to other people's driving. We would, be, we would be very wealthy. So I'm driving the other day, and I'm at a four-way stop sign, and I went out into town to do something, and I'm dressed like this. And the only difference that uh, I have between here and work is I have my badge on my belt. So I'm at a stop sign, and my tint on my car is a little on the dark side. It's within the law, but it's kind of dark, so you can't see in the car really well. And there's a car to my right at a four-way stop sign, and very few people here know how to work a four-way stop, but that's another, for another day. I look across as I go through, it's my turn. So I go through and the driver is giving me the middle finger. And I'm like, oh no, nope. I go through the intersection, I turn around. Did I tell you guys a story already? So I go, I do a, this is recent. So I turn around and I'm like, mm -mm, not today, this is no. So I'm gonna meet this person. So it's an act of disorderly conduct or threatening intimidation to give somebody the finger. That's the statute I was going with. Because as I'm doing my U-turn, I'm like, okay, what reason do I, what probable cause do I have to pull this guy over? I got to come up with something quick. So, I, so he sees me do a U-turn and he's like, oh crud, boom, he's gone. He's hauling butt away. And this is at Aspen and 12th Street, so it's a neighborhood. Now he's moving. He's moving so fast on a left turn that he takes, almost takes out the sign on the left-hand side of the road. And I'm like, mm-mm. I've got the dog that chases the rubber ball syndrome, meaning I will not stop until I get the rubber ball. If it goes over the Grand Canyon, I'm going over. So we go, he's going through the neighborhoods. I'm looking now, I've got a thousand different traffic violations. So he finally pulls, I put my red and blue lights on and you can see him in the rear view mirror going, oh crap. So I gotta gauge myself now, right? I can't go up to that car and be super unprofessional and what do I wanna do? I wanna pull him out of the, through the window, right? I can't do that. So I walk up, and um, if, you're, if you're on the internet a lot and you're on YouTube, watch Fridays with Frank. That guy's a, he's a, he's a deputy in Pinal County, I think. Fridays with Frank. That guy's awesome. So I remember in my head, Fridays with Frank, Fridays with Frank, you don't want to go to prison. So I walk up to the car, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And the driver's got his hands on the steering wheel. He's like 18. And I'm like, I'm Detective Wong from Cottonwood PD. Do you know why I stopped you? And he goes, yep. And I said, good. Do you want me to break that off when you give me that finger? Why did you give me the finger? And he goes, I don't know, just being stupid. But he accepted responsibility, which I thought was really awesome. So we had a chat, and we, he got schooled a little bit on why you don't want to do that. And fortunately for him, he got me and not somebody carrying a weapon who's <laughs> mentally deranged. So it worked. But anyway, I had to turn the other cheek to a degree, right? So good practice for me. Like the Bible says, a man sells a field and he sells everything to know God. God wants you to sell it. Be prepared to sell it. I'm not telling you to go home and sell your TV. And I just shared this with the leadership team a couple Fridays ago. We meet here Friday at 12 to 1. And I mentioned, hey, I'm getting rid of my TV. I, don't, I just don't watch it. And it's an extra 100 bucks a week or a month I could, I could save. That's not what I'm really talking about. Because for me, selling my TV is easy. But... I'm not telling you to go sell your house, sell your car, get a sandwich board and go stand down on Main Street. I'm not saying that. You have to gauge that. What do you have to get rid of to, to make your relationship better with the Father? 
He wants you to make room for him this week. We have to get the me out of the way and make room for him. Remember, you're not here by mistake. Don't leave without knowing what God has for you. Ty, Acts 1, verse 8. I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to go kind of quick so you guys can go enjoy your Sunday. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Pretty powerful. So I'm going to jump ahead because I'm running out of time here. Hey, Ty, go, can you jump ahead to 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5? That's okay. Let's see. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Sounds like today's world, right? Anyway, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Man, that's tough. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. That's Paul uh, preaching on this. But be ready. The point that I want to make is be ready in season and out of season. Are you, are you ready in season and out of season? And this is what I want to relate this to. So I'm on the, I had to be on the range last Monday, and it's a very, very busy time, and it's somewhat stressful for guys out there and gals because some people excel at that training and some people don't. So I'm standing out there, and I'm getting all my gear ready. It's pretty early in the morning, and I, there's, a, there's two different stations. There's groups of people that are going to one range, groups going to another range. So I'm minding my own business. I'm getting my stuff together. And there's a conversation taking place off to my left, and I hear, I, I'm, I hear them talking, but I don't know what they're talking about, and I'm getting my stuff ready, but I hear one of them say the word church. And I, bing, now I'm paying attention. So I'm like, okay, let's see what they're going to say. And one's like, hey, I haven't been to church in 20 years. And the other one says, yeah, I don't know what would happen if I walked into a church. I mean, uh, there'd probably be lightning bolts coming down. So right then, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect and what I do is right. You have to figure it out for you. But in my head, I'm thinking, Father, give me the words. Holy Spirit, give me the words to say. I don't know what I'm supposed to say now. Give me the words. I wasn't ready for it, and it came on fast. So I want to be able to respond to that in a positive manner. And I'm sure that there's somebody in the crowd here that's had the same situation go on. So I, I didn't have time. We, we went our separate ways, and I didn't have time to address it. So I'm in the kitchen, and I prayed, hey, Father, give me the words to, to deal with that next time so I have a word so I can get this out fast because I just couldn't think of a verse quickly off the top of my head to let these folks know. Hey, you go in a church, you're not going to get struck by lightning. That would be an awesome thing that you come here and get the word of God and do your thing. So it was really easy for me. When I got the word, I understood it. And all I was supposed to say, and this is what God told me, you, you'll never know until you try it. That's simple. Is that overbearing to them? Is that going to turn them off? No, not, not at all. It's a very peaceful, kind thing to say. You'll never know until you try it. You know, I've had people tell me in stores, they'll, they'll hear what I'm talking about, and they'll, they'll pass by me, and they'll say, they'll say five or six words to help me in a positive manner, and then they're gone. It's just an amazing thing. So be ready in season and not a season. So I need to stop because I'm already out of time. So I'm going to